Hello. As I said in an earlier lecture, modern history begins with the Renaissance and Reformation, a dual revolutions that acted as midwives at the birth of the modern world. I have devoted the last five lectures to the Renaissance. Now I'd like to devote the next five to that series of events referred to as the Protestant Reformation, so named to distinguish it from the movement towards reform that took place within the Catholic Church at the same time known as the Catholic or Counter-Reformation. The revolt against the Church initiated by Martin Luther that led to the Protestant Reformation destroyed Christian unity, triggered uh, a period of religious warfare that did not subside until around 1650 and sparked bitter social unrest. New nations formed in its wake, whilst old ones redefined their national identities. Beginning in the early 16th century, the Protestant Reformation completed the disintegration of medieval civilization begun by the Renaissance. Though primarily religious, social, economic, political, and nationalistic factors also played their part. As we've seen, the Catholic Church remained the indispensable institution during the Middle Ages. Despite the Great Schism of 1054, she continued to wield considerable power, acting to coordinate religious belief and practice and functioning as a civilizing influence and sole agency of social welfare. Unlike today, religion was not a matter of personal preference. Only through the church could one hope to achieve eternal salvation, and those who knowingly disavowed the teachings of the church, dubbed heretics, were treated harshly if they refused to recant. Why then did men like Luther, who were guilty of heresy after all, survive when others before them were burned as unrepentant heretics? In such a brief survey as this, the answer must by necessity be somewhat partial. In general, Luther survived to die in his bed because he enjoyed the support of powerful secular rulers and because the church that rightly condemned him as a heretic no longer wielded the unquestioned power it had possessed during the pontificate of Innocent III when the kings of France and England bowed to the papal will. What had happened to bring this about? One factor was the steady decline in papal power that had taken place during the 14th and 15th centuries as a result of the Babylonian captivity and Great Schism, when the popes had lived in Avignon during the former, and there had been two rival popes during the latter, and for a few years, three men claiming to be Christ's vicar on earth. This farcical situation made the church look ridiculous and corrupt. Although by the beginning of the Protestant Reformation the situation had been resolved, the damage to papal prestige remained. Those who opposed the papal monarchy, most especially the Concilia movement, which held that a general council should outrank the Pope, called for reform of the Church in head and members. Furthermore, although often exaggerated by anti-Catholic writers, some of those individuals who sat on the throne of St. Peter left much to be desired. Innocent VIII bringing little but scandal to his eight years as Christ's representative on earth, while the Spaniard Alexander VI publicly acknowledged his mistresses and made his illegitimate son a cardinal. Scandals within the papacy helped fuel growing anti-clericalism during the 14th and 15th centuries. While most clergy remained true to their faith and loyal to their flocks, anti-clerical sentiment was exacerbated by clerical immorality, poorly educated priests, and abuses like clerical pluralism in which a man held multiple offices simultaneously. Absenteeism that saw clergymen absent from their parishes or dioceses, and simony, the buying and selling of church offices sometimes by men who lacked the spiritual qualifications necessary for such offices. The perception that the church was too worldly and driven by greed led some to call for the return of Christianity to its original 
pristine condition and corrupted, as it were, by centuries of moral and spiritual decline and to recapture the vitality that had prevailed among Christ's early followers. St. Bernard of Clairvaux had set the tone in the 12th century when he complained that there was as much difference between us and the men of the primitive church as there is between muck and gold. Such sentiments triggered a revival of mysticism and pietism, especially among educated lay people living in the growing towns and cities of the North. Groups were formed and books published that reflected this tendency. The Brethren of the Common Life, for example, was founded to bring about a return to the golden age of the primitive Christianity of the early church. Meister Eckert in the German Rhineland urged Christians to seek direct understanding of God through mystical practices without recourse to the rituals of the church. And the imitation of Christ by the German priest Thomas Akempis, which became an international bestseller thanks to the printing press, urged Christians to literally imitate Christ in their everyday conduct. Others took a more direct approach. One such was the English Dominican and Oxford professor John Wycliffe who claimed that only God and Holy Scripture were valid sources of spiritual authority. Denying the exclusive authority of the church in such matters, he translated the Bible into English at a time when the Latin translation, known as the Vulgate, was the only official edition, and went on to challenge the validity of the sacraments and reject transubstantiation. Though clearly a heretic, Wycliffe was protected by powerful supporters known as Lollards and was thus spared the unrepentant heretic's death. His Czech contemporary, Jan Hus, was not so fortunate, however. Learning of Wycliffe's heretical teachings from Czech students returning to Prague in Bohemia from their studies at Oxford University, he began advocating communion in two kinds, so-called utraquism, which holds that communicants should be allowed both the bread and the wine when receiving the Eucharist. At the time, Bohemia was part of the German-dominated Holy Roman Empire, so his attacks on the church united Czech speakers in a crusade against both papal and German imperial authority. Given a safe conduct pass by the Holy Roman Emperor to attend the Council of Constance in 1415, this courageous but heretical priest was nevertheless burned at the stake as an unrepentant heretic. His death, incidentally, sparking a series of civil wars that continued in Bohemia until the Protestant Reformation. Another critic of the church who met a fiery death was the Italian Dominican, Girolamo Savonarola. By announcing vice and corruption in a series of mesmerizing speeches, this puritanical firebrand had himself appointed religious leader in Florence just two decades before Martin Luther stepped onto the stage of history. His coming to power toppled the Medici-dominated oligarchy that controlled Florence and led to the dreadful bonfire of the vanities in which Florentines were urged to burn anything that might foster vanity or sexual licentiousness, including copies of Boccaccio's Decameron Nights and possibly priceless paintings by Botticelli, who may have been a supporter of Savonarola at the time. This insufferable Dominican's fate was sealed, however, when he lost the support of the common people, the so-called popolo, and began denouncing the admittedly very corrupt Pope Alexander VI, a recklessness that led to his excommunication and death at the Florentine stake. His agonizing demise reminds us of the dangers of challenging the authority of the Church. However, I cannot finish this lecture describing the historical context that led to Luther's rebellion against Rome without alerting you to the often overlooked fact that the Church herself was aware of the need for reform. This is borne out by the Fifth Lateran Council 
an ecumenical council convened by Pope Julius II in 1512 and that sought to reform many of the abuses later attacked by Protestants. It is also borne out by those clerics like Cardinal Cisneros in Spain who enacted reforms locally, thereby inoculating parts of Europe against the Protestant virus. Lastly, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, social, economic, political and nationalistic forces, forces that were not obviously linked to religion, also played a decisive role in the Protestant Reformation and helped nurture an environment that was receptive to the querulous and divisive protestations of Martin Luther and others of his ilk. Evolving national sentiment, coupled with a, a xenophobic resentment against the invariably Italian popes, resistance to the flow of ecclesiastical revenues to Rome, envy of church wealth, and the desire among secular princes to rid their domains of papal interference, all created a context that helped fuel and pave the way for the confessional fractiousness that was soon to follow. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.